Oh, 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 we're here. This is my favorite thing to rant about because this is so commonplace in not just in the Philippines for uh, for the record, but also like globally. It's so commonplace, but it's just so irrational. At times, also very unethical, but it's still very widespread, and people get the wrong idea about what Kataibin is, how it works, and its overall risk benefit ratio. So let's break it down because I firmly believe that poor pharmacology leads to poor therapeutics. And this is one example of poor therapeutics low dose Kataibin for insomnia. Yay or nay? Obviously, nay, because I'm going to be ranting about this. It's absolutely irrational. But why is it irrational? So before we go to the therapeutics, Let's look at the pharmacology, again using our chocolate fountain model. Okay, so I'm just going to cover up the lock and key bit here as a so-called antipsychotic and as a second generation one at that, it binds to an awful lot. But of course, ketiapine is going to have its favorites. One of its really, really, really big favorites would be this, the H1 receptor favorites so much so that at low doses a whole chunk of ketiapine usually will fill it up first you know as a fountain at the very top the chocolate's gonna fill up the h1 receptors first block those which is where a big pharma first got the idea that hey we should use this at low doses for insomnia and you know true enough ketiapine is sedating yes and true enough we have seen clinical trials show that certain sleep outcomes have improved with ketiapine use at low doses. The question is, is it worth it, my friends? Is it worth it? It is absolutely not worth it. Because remember, this is a chocolate fountain. We are not just looking at the top layer. You got to look at all of this, okay? Again, poor pharmacology leads to poor therapeutics. First of all, at a low doses, it's not just the H1 receptor being bound. Looky here, we also have the alpha-1 receptor. That is orthostatic hypotension, falls and fractures. But beyond that, remember how I said that just because a drug has its favorites doesn't mean that the chocolate isn't going to splatter when you pour it at the top. Yeah, sure, at a low dose, it's going to fill up the H1 receptor first because it has a higher affinity for that. Yeah, sure. But it doesn't mean that the chocolate is not going to splatter about and, you know, kind of hit the other receptors at the bottom. Some of those receptors are very sensitive. You just have like a little binding to them and they're going to exert their effects. If you look at, we just talked about COVID, right? And how COVID kind of makes all the metabolic stuff a bigger concern. Think about how actually a lot of side effects, we're not actually sure if they are dependent on dose. Um, you look at Pillinger et al. 2019, you look at Los Yoshida and Takayuchi 2020, they did a review on dose dependency of side effects. Because the idea is, oh, at low doses, the other receptors aren't bound to a significant extent to cause side effects. But what if those side effects are not dependent on dose? What if you need only a tiny smidget of chocolate to splatter on the lower receptors to get a side effect? Particularly of note, the side effects for which we have no clear evidence of dose dependency meaning it is very possible to get these even at low doses, dyslipidemia, cholesterol, triglycerides, and all of that, and neutropenia, white blood cell depletion, which is, you know, really difficult thing on its own. But again, these two things very much worse when you consider COVID is still in the air as of this recording. I hope it's not very soon, but it still is. So, yeah. Because there's a really a big misconception that ah, ketiapine is safe at low doses. No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay, no, it's not. And 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 then and then you know from that point, there is the counter argument supposedly that are you saying that we should be jumping directly to benzos to Z drugs? First of all, where did I ever say that? Okay, rewind the recording, rewind the video. Where did I even mention benzos and Z drugs? This is what you call. A false dichotomy. A false dichotomy is when big pharma shills might claim that what but if the choice is just between addict potentially addictive and dependence inducing benzos and then you have ketiapine. Right? Okay, that's a false dichotomy. When you talk about insomnia, actually, and I have seen a lot of these cases, people coming to me with low dose ketiapine for insomnia, 
and I asked them if they were told about what the actual first line intervention for insomnia is, and they had no idea. So I had to counsel them on that. The first line intervention is not meds, actually. First line intervention is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And yes, I do have uh, an allegiance bias to this because this is basically the entire stick of my thesis, yes. But if you look at all of the clinical practice guidelines and systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, Edinger et al. Uh, 2021, the BAP guidelines, ASM guidelines, European Sleep Society guidelines, they all converge on, they are all in consensus that first line is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, including the principles of sleep hygiene, stimulus control, relaxation techniques, and so on. One thing that really stands out with the evidence is the benefits of these interventions outlast even that of meds. Yes, CBTI does have side effects. It has side effects, but the side effects tend to be a lot more manageable than those of any prescription med. Okay, because prescription meds any prescription meds for sleep, for the majority of population, they are generally just meant to be stop gaps. They are just meant to be used short term. Short term until the first line CBTI or at least derivatives of these interventions start kicking in. Because, yeah, it, it'll, it might take a while for um, a person's to change their daily routine, to their, their sleep cycle, their exercise, etc., etc., to fix all of that. Because it's like a 24-hour thing. It's not just a bedtime thing. Okay. So, in the meantime, you would need some meds to kind of, you know, because I can't sleep right now. CBTI isn't going to work immediately, so what do I do in the meantime? Okay, I need something. So, those, those are used generally as temporary solutions. So, in the meantime... Am I saying that we should jump directly to benzos? No! Again, that's a false dichotomy. So, okay, let's say you've brought in CBTI, but the person still needs help sleeping. Okay, what are our options? You know, the only reason, the one of the only main reasons that I have been sedating, actually, H1. You know what else blocks H1 that isn't as problematic as ketiapine? Typen hydrogen. Diphenhydramine only has to worry about two receptors, H1 and M1. Cadiapine also has to worry about M1. But at the same time, it's got alpha-1, and then it's got all of the non-dose dependent stuff like dyslipidemia and neutropenia. With diphenhydramine, you just gotta worry about anti-muscarinic stuff, um, which has, yeah, it has the CNS stuff with cognitive impairment. So does cadiapine. So does cadiapine, right? And it's like, you know, with both of these drugs all the same, Tolerance will develop with time. But even with Diphen, you would generally just want to take that short term because tolerance or loss of efficacy can develop within 10 days. Because eventually, you keep blocking these H1 receptors, the body will start upregulating them and it will lose its effect, basically, the effect when you block them at the same dose. So it, it's just there have been so many people who've been coming to me with this particular drug for this particular indication, and I asked them, So were you taught? about sleep hygiene, stimulus control, relaxation? No, not at all. Not at all. And the implication was this would be taken for a longer time than it should have been. Which is again, scary considering the dyslipidemia and the neutropenia. So it's like, there's no exit plan. Right? There's no exit plan. So again, poor pharmacology leads to poor therapeutics. It's important to understand that many of these side effects are not dose dependent. Um, or at least we have no evidence of their dose dependency, so they can occur at low doses. So the risks are just really not worth it. First line, CBTI, it doesn't work. You know, we have safer options. We have safer options. There are two exceptions for which you might uh, actually consider this, ketiopine, for insomnia. One of them, um, this is from Dr. George Dawson, I believe. If your only two choices, as if you've tried everything, on the shelf, and your only two choices left are ketiapine and alcohol. Yeah, I'd rather the person be on ketiapine than on alcohol because alcohol is deadlier by a long shot. Alcohol is actually the most deadly drug in the world. Deadlier than shabu, deadlier than cannabis, deadlier than cocaine, and all of that. It's like the deadliest. So I would ha sure, sure, yeah, for sure, take the ketiapine. The second scenario would be if this was something like ICU sedation because in the ICU, it's a higher risk for people developing delirium or just acute 
conditional states that can lead to adverse outcomes because of the antimuscarinic effects of, say, diphenhydramine. For those cases, I would definitely not recommend diphenhydramine. And sure, ketiapine has antimuscarinic effects, but it's balanced out by the D2 antagonism, which is helpful for delirium somehow, I guess. So, yeah. Um, those are the only two scenarios. Other than that, other than that, um, oh yeah, I did mention, you might be wondering, why did they see unethical? So, it got the irrational part. Now, why am I saying unethical? So, I mentioned early on in this part that the very first proponents of this were actually big pharma. Or, if not the very first, the biggest. In fact, if you check out the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, if you look at some cases involving pharmaceutical companies, you might spot that a certain AstraZeneca was required to pay... Five hundred and twenty million dollars. Let me link it here. I should be able to show it. Five hundred twenty million dollars for illegally, illegally marketing this drug for insomnia, among many other things. But one of them was for insomnia. So as in, that's five two zero 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 times fifty for Philippine peso. It's a lot. It's a lot. And clearly, they were very much willing to pay it because as of now, people still teach this. People still do this. This is still taught regularly in training programs for healthcare professionals. And it's saddening. It's frustrating. I even still see this in textbooks. So clearly, the $520 million worth of illegal marketing was worth it for them because, you know, it's still being widely done despite being extremely irrational. So please, I am begging you. Break the cycle. Let it end with us. We can end this. End the cycle of low dose catiapin for insomnia. Que horror. Que horror. Please. I even made a poem for this. Roses are pink. Catiapin 25 milligram tablets are orange. For those with insomnia who can't sleep a wink. Absolutely nothing rhymes with orange, so please, please, please stop giving ketiapine 25 milligrams for insomnia, please. Thank you.